Hey, what's up everybody? This is Caroline. Welcome back to the fifth part of Beginning Metal. In this video, we'll take an in-depth look at shader libraries and vertex and fragment functions and see how they fit into the pipeline. At the end of this video, your quad will be multicolored like this. You can see that each corner is a different color and all the pixels in between the corners are interpolated between those corner colors. We'll send color instructions to the vertex function. The vertex function will pass on the colors to the rasterizer and from there, the fragment function will return an interpolated color. So what are shaders? Shaders are small programs that run on the GPU. We use the term shader because of history. In the OpenGL pipeline, shaders used to control the shading. Nowadays, we're able to program the shader functions in the pipeline and do a lot more than just shading. But the term shader is convenient to generically describe these GPU programs. There are three types of shader functions. We use two of the types of shader function in the graphics pipeline, which we've already briefly looked at. Firstly, the vertex function, where we can manipulate the vertices just as we did when animating the quad. The second is the fragment function, where we can manipulate pixel colors. The kernel function is used for parallel programming and operates on a grid or an array of data. We're just going to be using the graphics functions, vertex and fragment. We've already had a look at setting up the pipeline state for the GPU. And for each GPU command in the command encoder, we set a particular pipeline state. This pipeline state tells the GPU what vertex and fragment functions to use. We created this pipeline state in the build pipeline state method. In this method, we create a new metal library with device.newDefault library. We then specify what functions should be in that library. We created these functions in a file called shader.metal using metal shading language. When we compile the project, Xcode compiles these .metal files into a special default library file. So unlike OpenGL, all our shader functions are compiled before the app even opens. We then give the pipeline descriptor the vertex and fragment functions to use and create the pipeline state from that pipeline descriptor. This all happens at the beginning of the app. It's very important to set up the pipeline states before the app gets into the game loop. Creating a pipeline state is an expensive operation and you don't want to be creating these while your game loop is running. We've already had a brief look at the vertex function. We define the vertex and fragment functions with the appropriate qualifier, in this case, vertex. The vertex function's job is to position the vertex in 3D space. This vertex function uses an array of floats in buffer zero and calculates the new position of each vertex. The output of this vertex function is the input of the next stage in the pipeline, the primitive assembler. One of the tricky things about metal is making sure that the data in the vertex function aligns with the data in your Swift code. If you send misaligned data, then your triangles can end up all over the place. When we're directly accessing buffer zero in the vertex function, we must exactly match the structure of the vertices array with the structure in the vertex function. In this case, just being floats, it's easy to do. But later, we'll be sending color and texture information along with the vertex position. We also have to convert the float 3 position to a float 4 for the rasterizer. When the data is more complex, there's a better way we can create a vertex descriptor that describes the vertices array and sends it along with the pipeline. The vertex function can then pick up this vertex descriptor and it knows exactly how the vertex information is structured. 
So let's have a look at sending color information to the vertex function. To make our quad multicolored, each vertex must have some color information associated with it. For example, here vertex 0 at the top left should be red and vertex 1 at the bottom left should be green. So we'll create a vertex struct with position and color and change the array of vertices to include color as well as position. I've only included the top left and bottom left vertices here in the array. You can see that the vertex at the top left has the color red, which is in RGB alpha format, and the bottom left vertex has the color green. We create the vertex descriptor like this, and later assign it to the pipeline state descriptor. Each attribute of the vertex descriptor describes an entry in the vertex struct. The first attribute has a format of float3 corresponding to position. The offset from the beginning of the struct is zero, and the vertex buffer index that we're associating with this vertex descriptor is buffer zero. The second attribute has a format of float4 corresponding to the color property. It has an offset from the beginning of the struct of float3, which is the size of the position property. The stride is the size of the entire struct and will tell the vertex function how many bytes is in each array entry. This may seem long-winded, but there are advantages. On the vertex function side, we don't have to make sure that the vertex struct members are in the same order or even the same data type. We don't have to worry that our data is aligned and the vertex descriptor is part of the pipeline state, so it's less prone to error. When you use vertex descriptors, you'll get mangled triangles less often. When you get a rendering result like this, you must first suspect the alignment of your data between the metal setup definition and the vertex function definition. Let's have a look at the vertex function side. At the top left here is the swift metal struct for each vertex. The one at the top right is the struct that the vertex function will use. Notice how each item in the struct is matched with the attribute index from the vertex descriptor set up on the previous slide. Because we're using a vertex descriptor, the types don't have to match. We're using a float4 on the GPU side and a float3 on the metal side. The vertex function becomes much simpler. Instead of using the buffer zero attribute qualifier in the vertex function, we use a stage in qualifier. And this tells the vertex function to look at the buffer using the pipeline's vertex descriptor. The parameter is no longer an array. We don't need to include the vertex ID as each vertex in the buffer will be processed. We gave the vertex descriptor a stride, which is how long each entry in the array is. This means the GPU can look at the vertex descriptor attributes and extract the struct data for every vertex in the buffer. And we're not converting the position type from float3 to float4 within the function anymore. Because we're now sending color information as well as position information, we'll need to return a struct from the vertex function. The rasterizer needs to know which item in the struct is the position. And the position property in the vertex out struct has a position attribute which marks it. After the rasterizer has worked out which fragments will appear on screen, the purpose of the fragment function is to describe what color each fragment or pixel will be. Currently, the fragment function simply returns the color yellow, so all our fragments are yellow. However, the fragment function will now need to receive the vertex's color information as a parameter. The vertex out struct from the vertex function becomes the vertex in data for the fragment with a stage in qualifier. Every item in vertex in is interpolated. So even though the color information here is for the corner vertices, each pixel when it's processed by the fragment function is interpolated from those corner colors. 
In the demo, we'll add a color to each vertex. Instead of just sending the vertex function floats containing the position data, we'll set up a struct that also contains the color data. The vertex function will then hand the color data to the fragment function, which will interpolate the result. We currently just have yellow triangles. In this demo, we're going to be sending vertex color information to the fragment function. We're also going to set up a vertex descriptor to describe our vertex structure. First, I'll set up a struct to describe what I'm going to send to the GPU. I'll create a new file called types and add the struct there. Each vertex will have a position and a color. The module that defines these float vectors is SIMD, so I need to import that. When I import MetalKit, SIMD is automatically included in that, which is why we haven't had to import SIMD before. I'll now change plane to use this vertex struct instead of just the list of floats. So here I've added color information to each of the vertices. The indices remain the same, as the list of vertices is the same, just with the added color information. We have to change the size of the vertex buffer, because it used to have floats, but now it's a vertex type. When using structs, because of internal padding, the stride method is more reliable than the size method for getting the exact size in memory. I need to describe to the pipeline our vertex struct using a vertex descriptor. Currently, the pipeline is in the renderer. When we come to create models other than a plane, we might have a different vertex descriptor, so the renderer is really the wrong place for the pipeline state. But for the moment, I will put the vertex descriptor in the renderer and shortly we'll refactor the whole pipeline state out of the renderer. In build pipeline state, we'll create the vertex descriptor. Then we describe each attribute of the vertex struct. First, we'll describe the position data. We tell the descriptor that the format of the first entry is a float 3, the offset from the beginning is 0, and the buffer index number of the vertex array will be 0. Similarly, we describe the color attribute. The color is a float 4, the offset is a float 3 from the beginning, that was the size of the position attribute. Now we tell the vertex descriptor the size of the information held for each vertex. And we set the pipeline state's vertex descriptor. On the shader side, we create the struct needed for the input. Note that each item in the struct has been given the attribute number and that I've defined the position as a float 4, even though the data held is only a float 3. This will be a convenience because we don't have to create a float 4 from a float 3 in the vertex function anymore. We change the first parameter of the vertex function. Now each vertex will be processed by looking at the struct vertex in, which assigns each item in the struct the attribute. These attributes, remember, were defined in the vertex descriptor, which is held in the GPU's pipeline state. I'll take out the animation and constant values for the moment. And we also don't need the vertex ID anymore, as we're not referencing an array. We need to return the position information and the color information to the rasterizer, so I'll create a struct for this. 
Notice the position attribute. This tells the rasterizer which of these data items contains the vertex position value. I'll now move the vertex in data to the vertex out. The position variable coming in is a float 4, so I don't need to make any conversion from float 3 to float 4 anymore. And we need to specify the return type as a vertex out instead of a float 4. And return vertex out. Now that we have the information for the fragment function in vertex out, we can receive it through the first parameter in the fragment function. Notice the special qualifier stage in. All the data in this vertex in struct has been interpolated during the rasterization process. In other words, it's data that the rasterizer has generated per fragment rather than one constant value for all fragments. So for example, if the function is currently processing a fragment midway between the top left and the bottom left, the color information here will be an interpolation of the top left's color and the bottom left's color. So we just return the vertex out in's color. Build and run. And we get our interpolated colors on the quad. You can see that metal can sometimes be a bit long-winded. However, that's where the power of metal lies. We can change anything we want. Our quad is currently multicolored. Your challenge is firstly to render this quad in shades of gray. You'll still use the color information, but in the fragment function, you'll reduce the color to grayscale. You'll also reorganize the code and create a renderable protocol. Doing this will allow us to get the pipeline information out of the renderer. All instructions are in the challenge document accompanying this video. And that's it for this video tutorial. In the next video, we'll texture the quad with an image. I hope you enjoyed this video tutorial. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.